Hello and welcome. In the following video, we will perform a hands-on lab on dynamic NAT. But before jumping into the lab part, let's have a quick review on the topic at hand. Dynamic NAT works on the concept of IP pools. You purchase a pool of public IP addresses from the ISP and map your private IP address range. So if you have a pool of two public IP addresses and have three clients residing on your private network, only two can talk to the internet at a given time. The third client will have to wait until one of the public IP is free. Until then, its traffic will be dropped. Note that this is not port address translation. It's a full IP protocol translation means all IP protocol numbers are natted onto one of the IP addresses within the public IP pool. Welcome to the third lab and most probably final lab of the series. Today we will be performing dynamic NAT on a Cisco router. Now as a typical norm in this series, this lab is going to be performed on Packet Tracer and the same lab will be available in the description for you to download or if you're watching this on our website, it will be available in the downloads area. Now people often confuse NAT overload, also known as PAT, with dynamic NAT and they think they are the same thing. In reality, that is not the case. However, you could use NAT overload and dynamic NAT together, which we will also cover in this lab. Time to give you the lab overview. Up on the left side, we have our organization in which we have three desktops with IP addresses already configured. Then we have a layer two switch, which has all of its ports in VLAN one, and they are all access ports. And finally, we have our NAT router, which is unconfigured in terms of NAT. So no NAT statements or NAT interfaces have been configured on this NAT router. Now in the middle, again, we are emulating an ISP environment with only a single router. And with a cloud icon, as you can see uh, over here, this is just an icon that I'm using. Now in the right, we have a router that has Telnet enabled on it for its remote management. The reason why I use a router in this lab is because of its terminal capability to run some show commands because I need you to see the source IP addresses once they are um, accessing this Telnet server. Now I could have used a web server here and I was using a web server before but in Packet Tracer there is some issue with the netstat commands which is a command to actually see the connections that are made from your uh, server or if anyone else is making a connection to me you could see those connections, but it doesn't really work in Packet Tracer um, effectively. So that's why I used a Telnet server here. Okay, one of the things I forgot to mention uh, is this public IP pool that we have purchased from our ISP. Now in reality, you're also going to be purchasing your IP pool from the ISP where you get your primary WAN connection. Um, that is normally the case. And we have got a slash 30 and so we have two usable IP addresses in that. So jumping to the lab guidelines that we have here down here, uh, we have to, uh, the first step that we have to do is create an ACL defining the private IPs which will be subject to dynamic NAT. It's kind of like the same in NAT overload if you have seen that lab. So let's start configuring it. We kind of have one subnet here in our inside domain so let's configure that. All right, here it is. Here is our router, NAT router. And just to give you a show run here, show running config, um, I only have the interfaces configured with IP addresses and a default route, which I forgot, I think, in the last lab. So today that won't be happening, hopefully. Uh, and, and I do have a Telnet configured. I was just testing stuff here, so no problems with that. Okay. Um, Configure terminal. Let's go into global configuration mode and IP access list extended. And we're going to make an extended ACL and because that is the best practice because in the next series, which I am making at, at this time, we're going to do NAT exemption uh, there. So that will be very handy for you. So let's name this. Let's name this um, ACL as inside pool. Okay, I'll just name it inside pool. So it's kind of like a pool of uh, inside IP addresses or the private IP addresses. And um, permit IP. 
and it's going to be 192, 168. Let me just cross verify that. That's 1, right? 1.0. And the default subnet masks inverted wildcard mask is 0 .0 0.0.0.255. That is a source that I'm specifying, and destination should could be any. Okay, so I, I'm not specifying any destinations for that subnet. And that's pretty much it. In the in the end, we have an implicit deny as you have seen this happening in the first lab of this series. So let's cross verify that access list. Here is our access list that we are created off our private IP pool. Next up, we need to define the public pool for NAT. So here is our public pool in which we have two usable addresses, a.a.a.1 and a.a.a.2. And one of them, a.a.a.0, is the network ID, and a.a.a.3 will be the broadcast ID. So now you don't really need to configure uh, this IP address anywhere. There, this is the first. This is the first misconception or common mistake that people are uh, start to make. That hey, um, I've got the pool. So where do I assign it? And people do assign it on loopbacks and stuff, but it's not needed. Let me show you how this actually works. First of all, let us let me define the pool. It's pretty straightforward forward command, IP NAT pool. And it's going to be a pool name, so I'm going to say NAT underscore pool. NAT pool. And the start IP is a dot, sorry, a dot, a dot, what is, was it, 8? Uh, no, it was double 8, dot 8. Dot eight dot one. I'm sorry if I uh, misread uh, that in, in like two minutes ago when I, while I was discussing network ID and broadcast ID. What I meant was double eight dot eight dot eight dot zero and so on. So okay, what is the start IP of the pool and what is the end IP? So the end IP is eight dot eight dot two. And what is the network mask that you have gotten from your ISP? And that is slash 30. Now slash 30, uh, the subnet mass of slash 30 is 255.255.255.252. So there it is, you have configured the NAT pool and that is pr pretty much it actually about the NAT pool. Uh, show run and as you can see this is your NAT pool that you have configured and we have to call it in our NAT statement once we get there. So this is how you create a NAT pool for dynamic NAT. All right, here comes the simplest step of all, and that is configuring the inside and outside interfaces. And uh, gig zero says zero, says zero. This one is the inside interface. Let's do that real quick because our inside devices reside on this interface. Gig zero says zero, says zero. IP NAT inside. And here is our outside interface. So we're going to be defining that or just Tagging that up. interface gig zero slash zero slash one IP NAT outside. So that's pretty much it. If you want to see show IP NAT statistics, uh, you can see that your outside and inter inside interfaces have been configured. Now here is the dynamic NAT statement which you have been waiting for. Let's configure it. Now it's kind of like the NAT overload statement that you have seen. We're going to start with IP NAT inside and we're going to define the source. The source is defined in an access list. So whenever an access list is uh, being called, you have to specify the list keyword in this NAT statement and the access list name or number. Now, truth be told, I have forgotten what is what was the uh, access list name. So do a choose show IP access list. And inside pool was the name. All right, uh, list. I'll just copy that so that I don't make any mistakes. And in production, you should also do this. Copy and paste. And now there is a difference here that you have to specify the pool of IP addresses. So defining the pool. And the pool is already, already defined um, here. Where was the pool? There is the pool, and that's its name. NAT underscore pool. Let's just copy that and paste that here. And this is the moment where you will decide whether you want overload to work in conjunction with dynamic NAT. 
here's what will happen. If I hit enter right now, dynamic NAT will happen and one to one correspondence of IP address NAT will happen. I will show you that. If I hit the overload keyword here, it's going to start overloading or doing PAT, uh, which I'm going to be showing you later in this lab. So first, let's uh, just hit enter right now and let's see what happens with dynamic NAT. Now to verify dynamic NAT, we have three PCs, PC A, B, and C on the left side behind the NAT boundary router. And we have a telnet server that they are going to be telnetting. And we're going to be seeing what's going to happen with their source IP addresses once they access that telnet server. So first, let's go to PC A. And uh, first of all, I'll do a show IP, uh, IP config. Sorry about the show. Uh, 192.168.1.10, that is that IP address that has been configured on PCA and it's going to do a telnet. First of all, I'm going to do a ping to 182.10.10.1 and there are, going to be, there are going to be some ARP request messages that are going to be dropped. Um, okay, so that is pingable. So let's do a telnet to 182.10.10.1. So Cisco, Cisco, great. Now let me let me just uh, hit this command show TCP brief and this is the reason I basically um, went with the telnet server instead of a web server because this command is available on a Cisco router and just love it because you can see the TCP connections. Now local address we have 182.10.10.1 and on port 23. Remember, this is the output that we're seeing sitting on the telnet server itself. So from its perspective, the local address is itself and which is 182.10.10.01 and somebody's hitting him on port 23. And what's the source IP address of that somebody that's hitting me on port 23? That is one with the source port number of 1025. Now, if you were to look at the NAT router with the NAT translations, show IP NAT translations, we have a translation for PCA. This is the inside local address, 192.168.1.10. That is the IP address of PCA with the source port of 1025. And that is exactly the same port that we're seeing on the telnet server. And the source which was translated uh, for PCA was 88.8.1. One uh, with that source port number that we have of that was generated by PCA. So at this time, PCA has been allocated this IP address, this public IP address from the NAT pool of 88.8.8.1. Now, if you were to go to PCB, for instance, and let's say I'm just doing a, I'll just do a Telnet connection, okay. A telnet connection to that telnet server, which is on 182.10.10.1. And sure enough, I can access it. And let's do a show, 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 show TCP brief and check that out. Now, this was the entry that we just saw uh, for PCA. So PCA was given this IP, this source IP address from the NAT pool with a source port of 1025. And this is basically PCB's source IP address as it accesses this telnet server. So it has been given a second IP address from the public NAT pool. Now to show that, um, we're going to hit that show IP NAT transitions commands again. And what we see here is uh, we have one translation. This is for PCA. And we have the second translation, which is for PCB. And it has been allocated 88.8.8.2 IP address. Now, because both the IP addresses have been allocated to two um, PCs, we had two addresses and now we have two PCs communicating using those addresses. Now, the third one won't be given any internet access or won't be actually netted uh, with the you know, like there is no pool, uh, there is no IP address in the pool now. So if we do try to do a telnet from PC, uh, PCC 182.10.10. What was that one? Okay. 
even if I try to do that because there aren't any addresses left in the public IP pool, so I cannot actually allot that to you. The only way um, was that if one of these guys would leave uh, the, one of the, those public IP addresses. Now, in Packet Restore, I don't think there is a way to actually delete a specific NAT entry. Um, even if I do uh, exit on that session, it'll take a little bit of time. Uh, but let me just see that if PCB actually did an exit right now. So the connection is down. The TCP has broken down. It takes around five minutes, if I'm not wrong, in the real life, um, or maybe much more than that. I am not sure about Packet Tracer. So yeah, the NAT statement, the NAT entry is still there. Let me just pause this video real quick and see if this NAT entry will go away. Sometimes it doesn't because it's Packet Tracer. You can expect anything from it. So let's wait and see after, if after five minutes this entry does go away. If it does, we'll be testing PCC by telnetting to the same IP address of 182.10.10.01 and see the results. Okay, so after waiting more than five minutes, the translation did not go away. So I had to do a clear IP NAT translations and show IP NAT translation. No translation is happening as of right now. So I'll just make a translation again from PCA and I'll do a telnet. Um, Cisco, Cisco, Cisco. So show TCP brief. And as you can see, now we're getting an IP of a dot a dot a dot two. Now PCA is getting that IP address. And uh, let me just uh, go to the NAT router and show the translation. Okay, now the 192.168.1.10 is PCA's IP address. Now it is getting an IP from the pool uh, that is 88.8.8.2. Uh, so that's good. Now only one other PC can have access. Um, for example, I don't even remember which PC I was testing it on, but the thing is that you see the one-to-one -one correspondence or correlation we have in dynamic NAT? It's not like NAT overload that you have seen. So only two PCs, if you have two IP addresses, two public IP addresses configured, like this pool that you have here with two usable IP addresses, only two PCs can access the internet or talk to the telnet server in this situation. Now, for instance, we are not allowed to use NAT overload using this WAN IP address. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to be combining dynamic NAT with NAT overload in that case. Now, um, let's go. Let's see what we have here. Show run. And this is the dynamic NAT. And uh, if you if you if you would see that this is the dynamic NAT we have configured. Uh, configure terminal and I'll do a no oh right don't need to do a no I'll just say IP NAT inside source list copy that and pasted that here and use the NAT overload keyword now if I do that and if I do a clear IP NAT translation here show ip nat translation oh sorry sorry yeah okay so so now let me do a talent uh, actually i already have a talent session configured so one session is for pca as you can see it has been granted this ip address it it ada data two and then we have our pcb Talent 182.10.10.1 and Cisco and Cisco. Show okay, let me just see the translations first. All right, there it is. This is for the 20, the PCB, and it also has been granted this IP address from the pool, from the public IP pool, and it's been now overloaded. Just like in the NAT overload lab, just we have a public IP pool here instead of using the van address uh, over here we're using the public IP pool 
okay let's see let's just to verify if it's all working we'll just have to do a telnet from pcc hmm now let me see why is this happening this this normally does happen sometimes i'm not sure why let me do first do a ping 182.10.10.1 there it is you can ping it so yeah there it is so it's, there was possibly an arp issue so if i go to this router now and do a show ip net translation ignore these guys uh, these are the icmp protocol packets that i just initiated from pcc these are the translations that are happening and if you have to look you can see that everyone is getting port address translated now or NAT overloaded onto a single IP address of 88.8.8.2 so all of it is working now where does the dynamic NAT come in here now it will jump in once all the port numbers against this public IP address have been exhausted then they will jump on to 88.8.8.1 and then start using the port numbers associated with that IP address. You get the concept? So how they work in conjunction with dynamic NAT? That won't really happen in reality because, uh, you know, uh, if you have one IP address, normally it's more than enough because your NAT router also has resources and that many NAT translations are very rare to happen. Even if they do, your NAT router will be bogged up uh, but nowadays, the routers that are coming up have tons of RAMs, and they can actually uh, do that if, if you wanted them to do that, but it'll be insane. Normally, I haven't actually seen this happening. Truth be told, I have seen pools that people have bought from the ISP, and they have been wasted. They aren't being used for years. Uh, there is no use for them, especially because of the cloud computing infrastructure we have nowadays of IWS and SAS and PaaS and whatnot. So for so, so the use of these public IP addresses, there was a time actually that we had email servers and stuff that were, were residing inside our environment and we needed these kind of IP addresses, these public IP addresses. But nowadays, everything is moving to the cloud, man. So these things are going away and that is the reason you won't be seeing this used as much i don't say it isn't being used but it is used very rarely now in my career in seven to eight years that i haven't really seen i have seen pools configured on the router but haven't actually seen the use of it there are some use cases here and there but um, you won't really see that a lot in the industry well i hope this has been informative for you and i'd like to thank you for viewing